Chapter 100 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 100 The Apparition. As the procureur had told Madame Danglars, Valentine was not yet recovered. Bowed down with fatigue, she was indeed confined to her bed, and it was in her own room and from the lips of Madame de Villefort that she heard all the strange events we have related. We mean the flight of Eugenie and the arrest of Andrea Cavalcanti, or rather Benedetto, together with the accusation of murder pronounced against him. But Valentine was so weak that this recital scarcely produced the same effect it would have done had she been in her usual state of health. Indeed, her brain was only the seat of vague ideas and confused forms, mingled with strange fancies, alone presented themselves before her eyes. During the daytime, Valentine's perceptions remained tolerably clear, owing to the constant presence of Monsieur Noirtier, who caused himself to be carried to his granddaughter's room, and watched her with his paternal tenderness. Villefort also, on his return from the law courts, frequently passed an hour or two with his father and child. At six o'clock, Villefort retired to his study. At eight, Monsieur d'Avrigny himself arrived, bringing the night draft prepared for the young girl, and then Monsieur Noirtier was carried away. A nurse of the doctor's choice succeeded them, and never left till about ten or eleven o'clock when Valentine was asleep. As she went downstairs, she gave the keys of Valentine's room to Monsieur de Villefort, so that no one could reach the sick room excepting through that of Madame de Villefort and little Edward. Every morning Morel called on Noirtier to receive news of Valentine, and, extraordinary as it seemed, each day found him less uneasy. Certainly, though Valentine still laboured under dreadful nervous excitement, she was better, and, moreover, Monte Cristo had told him when, half distracted, he had rushed to the Count's house, that if she were not dead in two hours, she would be saved. Now four days had elapsed, and Valentine still lived. The nervous excitement of which we speak pursued Valentine even in her sleep, or rather in that state of somnolence which succeeded her waking hours. It was then, in the silence of night, in the dim light shed from the alabaster lamp on the chimney-piece, that she saw the shadows pass and repass which hover over the bed of sickness, and fan the fever with their trembling wings. First she fancied she saw her stepmother threatening her, then Morel stretched his arms towards her. Sometimes mere strangers like the Count of Monte Cristo came to visit her. Even the very furniture, in these moments of delirium, seemed to move, and this state lasted till about three o'clock in the morning, when a deep, heavy slumber overcame the young girl, from which she did not awake till daylight. On the evening of the day on which Valentine had learned of the flight of Eugénie and the arrest of Benedetto, Villefort, having retired as well as Noirtier and Davrigny, her thoughts wandered in a confused maze, alternately reviewing her own situation and the events she had just heard. Eleven o'clock had struck. The nurse, having placed the beverage prepared by the doctor within reach of the patient, and locked the door, was listening with terror to the comments of the servants in the kitchen, and storing her memory with all the horrible stories which had for some months past amused the occupants of the antechambers in the house of the king's attorney. Meanwhile an unexpected scene was passing in the room which had been so carefully locked. Ten minutes had elapsed since the nurse had left. Valentine, who for the last hour had been suffering from the fever which returned nightly, incapable of controlling her ideas, was forced to yield to the excitement which exhausted itself in producing and reproducing a succession and recurrence of the same fancies and images. The night lamp threw out countless rays, each resolving itself into some strange form to her disordered imagination, when suddenly by its flickering light Valentine thought she saw the door of her library, which was in the recess by the chimney-piece, open slowly, though she in vain listened for the sound of the hinges on which it turned. At any other time Valentine would have seized the silken bell-pull and summoned assistance, but nothing astonished her in her present situation. 
Her reason told her that all the visions she beheld were but the children of her imagination, and the conviction was strengthened by the fact that in the morning no traces remained of the nocturnal phantoms who disappeared with the coming of daylight. From behind the door a human figure appeared, but the girl was too familiar with such apparitions to be alarmed, and therefore only stared, hoping to recognize Morel. The figure advanced toward the bed and appeared to listen with profound attention. At this moment a ray of light glanced across the face of the midnight visitor. "'It is not he,' she murmured, and waited, in the assurance that this was but a dream, for the man to disappear or assume some other form. Still, she felt her pulse, and finding it throb violently, she remembered that the best method of dispelling such illusions was to drink, for a draught of the beverage prepared by the doctor to allay her fever seemed to cause a reaction of the brain, and for a short time she suffered less. Valentine, therefore, reached her hand towards the glass, but as soon as her trembling arm left the bed, the apparition advanced more quickly towards her and approached the young girl so closely that she fancied she heard his breath and felt the pressure of his hand. This time the illusion, or rather the reality, surpassed anything Valentine had before experienced. She began to believe herself really alive and awake, and the belief that her reason was this time not deceived made her shudder. The pressure she felt was evidently intended to arrest her arm, and she slowly withdrew it. Then the figure, from whom she could not detach her eyes, and who appeared more protecting than menacing, took the glass and, walking towards the nightlight, held it up as if to test its transparency. This did not seem sufficient. The man, or rather the ghost, for he trod so softly that no sound was heard, then poured out about a spoonful into the glass and drank it. Valentine witnessed this scene with a sentiment of stupefaction. Every minute she had expected that it would vanish and give place to another vision, but the man, instead of dissolving like a shadow, again approached her and said in an agitated voice, "'Now you may drink.' Valentine shuddered. It was the first time one of these visions had ever addressed her in a living voice, and she was about to utter an exclamation. The man placed his finger on her lips. "'The Count of Monte Cristo,' she murmured. It was easy to see that no doubt now remained in the young girl's mind as to the reality of the scene. Her eyes started with terror, her hands trembled, and she rapidly drew the bedclothes closer to her. Still, the presence of Monte Cristo at such an hour, his mysterious, fanciful and extraordinary entrance into her room through the wall, might well seem impossibilities to her shattered reason. "'Do not call anyone. Do not be alarmed.' said the Count. Do not let a shade of suspicion or uneasiness remain in your breast. The man standing before you, Valentine, for this time it is no ghost, is nothing more than the tenderest father, and the most respectful friend you could dream of. Valentine could not reply. The voice which indicated the real presence of a being in the room alarmed her so much that she feared to utter a syllable. Still, the expression of her eyes seemed to inquire, "'If your intentions are pure, why are you here?' The Count's marvellous sagacity understood all that was passing in the young girl's mind. "'Listen to me,' he said. "'Or rather look upon me, look at my face, paler even than usual, and my eyes red with weariness. For four days I have not closed them, for I have been constantly watching you to protect and preserve you for Maximilian.' The blood mounted rapidly to the cheeks of Valentine, for the name just announced by the Count dispelled all the fear with which his presence had inspired her. Maximilia, she exclaimed, and so sweet did the sound appear to her that she repeated it. Maximilia, has he then owned all to you? Everything. He told me your life was his, and I have promised him that you shall live. You have promised him? "'That I shall live?' "'Yes.' "'But, sir, you spoke of vigilance and protection. "'Are you a doctor?' "'Yes, the best you can have at the present time. "'Believe me.' 
"'But you say you have watched,' said Valentine uneasily. "'Where have you been? I have not seen you.' The Count extended his hand towards the library. "'I was hidden behind that door,' he said, "'which leads into the next house, which I have rented.' Valentine turned her eyes away and, with an indignant expression of pride and modest fear, exclaimed, "'Sir, I think you have been guilty of an unparalleled intrusion.' and that what you call protection is more like an insult. Valentine, he answered, during my long watch over you, all I have observed has been what people visited you, what nourishment was prepared, and what beverage was served. Then, when the latter appeared dangerous to me, I entered, as I have now done, and substituted, in the place of the poison, a healthful draught, which, instead of producing the death intended, "'caused life to circulate in your veins.' "'Poison? Death?' exclaimed Valentine, "'half believing herself under the influence of some feverish hallucination. "'What are you saying, sir?' "'Hush, my child,' said Monte Cristo, "'again placing his finger upon her lips. "'I did say poison and death, but drink some of this.' "'And the Count took a bottle from his pocket, "'containing a red liquid,' of which he poured a few drops into the glass. "'Drink this, and then take nothing more to-night.' Valentine stretched out her hand, but scarcely had she touched the glass when she drew back in fear. Monte Cristo took the glass, drank half its contents, and then presented it to Valentine, who smiled and swallowed the rest. "'Oh, yes,' she exclaimed. "'I recognize the flavor of my nocturnal beverage,' which refreshed me so much, and seemed to ease my aching brain. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is how you have lived during the last four nights, Valentine, said the Count. But, oh, how I passed at that time! Oh, the wretched hours I have endured! The torture to which I have submitted, when I saw the deadly poison poured into your glass, and how I trembled lest you should drink it before I could find time to throw it away. Sir! said Valentine, at the height of her terror. "'You say you endured tortures when you saw the deadly poison poured into my glass. But if you saw this, you must also have seen the person who poured it.' "'Yes.' Valentine raised herself in bed and drew over her chest, which appeared whiter than snow, the embroidered cambric, still moist with the cold dews of delirium, to which were now added those of terror. "'You saw the person?' repeated the young girl. "'Yes,' repeated the Count. "'What you tell me is horrible, sir. "'You wish to make me believe something too dreadful. "'What? "'Attempt to murder me in my father's house, "'in my room, on my bed of sickness? "'Oh, leave me, sir. "'You are tempting me. "'You make me doubt the goodness of Providence. "'It is impossible. "'It cannot be.' "'Are you the first that this hand has stricken?' Have you not seen Monsieur de Saint Meron, Madame de Saint Meron, Barrois, all fall? Would not Monsieur Noirtier also have fallen victim, had not the treatment he has been pursuing for the last three years neutralized the effects of the poison? Oh heaven! said Valentine, is this the reason my grandpapa has made me share all his beverages during the last months? And have they all tasted of a slightly bitter flavour? "'Like that of dried orange peel?' "'Oh, yes, yes.' "'Then that explains all,' said Monte Cristo. "'Your grandfather knows, then, that a poisoner lives here. "'Perhaps he even suspects the person. "'He has been fortifying you, his beloved child, "'against the fatal effects of the poison, "'which has failed because your system was already impregnated with it. "'But even this would have availed little "'against a more deadly medium of death.' "'employed four days ago, which is generally but too fatal. "'But who, then, is this assassin, this murderer? "'Let me also ask you a question. "'Have you never seen any one enter into your room at night?' "'Oh, yes. "'I have frequently seen shadows pass close to me, approach and disappear. "'But I took them for visions raised by my feverish imagination.' And indeed, when you entered, I thought I was under the influence of delirium. 
then you do not know who it is that attempts your life. No, said Valentine. Who could desire my death? You shall know it now, then, said Monte Cristo, listening. How do you mean? said Valentine, looking anxiously around. Because you are not feverish or delirious tonight, but thoroughly awake. Midnight is striking, which is the hour murderers choose. Oh, heavens! exclaimed Valentine, wiping off the drops which ran down her forehead. Midnight struck slowly and sadly. Every hour seemed to strike with leaden weight upon the heart of the poor girl. Valentine, said the Count, summon up all your courage, still the beatings of your heart, do not let a sound escape you, and feign to be asleep. Then you will see. Valentine seized the Count's hand. I think I hear a noise, she said. Leave me. Goodbye, for the present, replied the Count, walking upon tiptoe towards the library door, and smiling with an expression so sad and paternal that the young girl's heart was filled with gratitude. Before closing the door, he turned around once more and said, Not a movement, not a word. Let them think you are asleep, or perhaps you may be killed before I have the power of helping you. And with this fearful injunction, the Count disappeared through the door, which noiselessly closed after him. End of chapter 100《Chapter 101 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas》Chapter 101 Locusta Valentine was alone. Two other clocks, slower than that of Saint-Philippe du Roule, struck the hour of midnight from different directions, and accepting the rumbling of a few carriages, all was silent. Then Valentine's attention was engrossed by the clock in her room, which marked the seconds. She began counting them, remarking that they were much slower than the beatings of her heart, and still she doubted. The inoffensive Valentine could not imagine that anyone should desire her death. Why should they? To what end? What had she done to excite the malice of an enemy? There was no fear of her falling asleep. One terrible idea pressed upon her mind, that someone existed in the world who had attempted to assassinate her and who was about to endeavour to do so again. Supposing this person wearied at the inefficacy of the poison, should, as Monte Cristo intimated, have recourse to steel, what if the Count should have no time to run to her rescue? What if her last moments were approaching and she should never again see Morel? When this terrible chain of ideas presented itself, Valentine was nearly persuaded to ring the bell and call for help but through the door she fancied she saw the luminous eye of the Count, that eye which lived in her memory, and the recollection overwhelmed her with so much shame that she asked herself whether any amount of gratitude could ever repay his adventurous and devoted friendship. Twenty minutes, twenty tedious minutes, passed thus, then ten more, and at last the clock struck the half-hour. Just then, the sound of fingernails slightly grating against the door of the library informed Valentine that the Count was still watching, and recommended her to do the same. At the same time, on the opposite side, that is, towards Edward's room, Valentine fancied that she heard the creaking of the floor. She listened attentively, holding her breath till she was nearly suffocated. The lock turned, and the door slowly opened. Valentine had raised herself upon her elbow and had scarcely time to throw herself down on the bed and shade her eyes with her arm. Then, trembling, agitated, and her heart beating with indescribable terror, she awaited the event. Someone approached the bed and drew back the curtains. Valentine summoned every effort and breathed with that regular respiration which announces tranquil sleep. Valentine, said a low voice, Still silent, Valentine had promised not to awake. Then everything was still, excepting that Valentine heard the almost noiseless sound of some liquid being poured into the glass she had just emptied. Then she ventured to open her eyelids, 
and glance over her extended arm. She saw a woman in a white dressing gown pouring a liquor from a phial into her glass. During this short time, Valentine must have held her breath or moved in some slight degree, for the woman, disturbed, stopped and leaned over the bed in order the better to ascertain whether Valentine slept. It was Madame de Villefort. On recognizing her stepmother, Valentine could not repress a shudder, which caused a vibration in the bed. Madame de Villefort instantly stepped back close to the wall, and there, shaded by the bed curtains, she silently and attentively watched the slightest movement of Valentine. The latter recollected the terrible caution of Monte Cristo. She fancied that the hand not holding the file clasped a long, sharp knife. Then collecting all her remaining strength, she forced herself to close her eyes. But this simple operation upon the most delicate organs of our frame, generally so easy to accomplish, became almost impossible at this moment. So much did curiosity struggle to retain the eyelid open and learn the truth. Madame de Villefort, however, reassured by the silence, which was alone disturbed by the regular breathing of Valentine, again extended her hand, and half hidden by the curtains, succeeded in emptying the contents of the phial into the glass. Then she retired so gently that Valentine did not know she had left the room. She only witnessed the withdrawal of the arm, the fair round arm of a woman but twenty-five years old, and who yet spread death around her. It is impossible to describe the sensations experienced by Valentine during the minute and a half Madame de Villefort remained in the room. The grating against the library door aroused the young girl from the stupor in which she was plunged, and which almost amounted to insensibility. She raised her head with an effort. The noiseless door again turned on its hinges, and the Count of Monte Cristo reappeared. Well, said he, do you still doubt? Oh, murmured the young girl, have you seen? Alas, did you recognize? Valentine groaned. Oh, yes, she said, I saw, but I cannot believe. Would you rather die, then, and cause Maximilian's death? Oh, repeated the young girl, almost bewildered, can I not leave the house? Can I not escape? Valentine, the hand which now threatens you will pursue you everywhere. Your servants will be seduced with gold, and death will be offered to you disguised in every shape. You will find it in the water you drink from the spring, in the fruit you pluck from the tree. But did you not say that my kind grandfather's precaution had neutralized the poison? Yes, but not against a strong dose. The poison will be changed and the quantity increased. He took the glass and raised it to his lips. It is already done, he said. Brucine is no longer employed, but a simple narcotic. I can recognize the flavor of the alcohol in which it has been dissolved. If you had taken what Madame de Villefort has poured into your glass, Valentine, Valentine, you would have been doomed. But exclaimed the young girl. Why am I thus pursued? Why? Are you so kind, so good, so unsuspicious of ill, that you cannot understand, Valentine? No, I have never injured her. But you are rich, Valentine. You have two hundred thousand livres a year, and you prevent her son from enjoying those two hundred thousand livres. How so? The fortune is not her gift, but is inherited from my relations. Certainly, and that is why Monsieur and Madame de Saint Meron have died. That is why Monsieur Noirtier was sentenced the day he made you his heir. That is why you, in your turn, are to die. It is because your father would inherit your property, and your brother, his only son, succeed to his. Edward, poor child, are all these crimes committed on his account? Ah, then you at length understand. Heaven grant that this may not be visited upon him. Valentine, you are an angel. But why is my grandfather allowed to live? It was considered that you dead 
the fortune would naturally revert to your brother, unless he were disinherited, and besides, the crime appearing useless, it would be folly to commit it. And is it possible that this frightful combination of crimes has been invented by a woman? Do you recollect, in the arbour of the Hotel de Poste at Perugia, seeing a man in a brown cloak whom your stepmother was questioning upon Aqua Tofana? Well, ever since then, the infernal project has been ripening in her brain. Ah, then indeed, sir, said the sweet girl, bathed in tears. I see that I am condemned to die. No, Valentine, for I have foreseen all their plots. No, your enemy is conquered, since we know her, and you will live, Valentine, live to be happy yourself, and to confer happiness upon a noble heart. But to ensure this, you must rely on me. Command me, sir. What am I to do? You must blindly take what I give you. Alas, were it only for my own sake, I should prefer to die. You must not confide in anyone, not even in your father. My father is not engaged in this fearful plot, is he, sir? asked Valentine, clasping her hands. No, and yet your father, a man accustomed to judicial accusations, ought to have known that all these deaths have not happened naturally. It is he who should have watched over you. He should have occupied my place. He should have emptied that glass. He should have risen against the assassin. Spectre against spectre, he murmured in a low voice as he concluded his sentence. Sir, said Valentine, I will do all I can to live, for there are two beings whose existence depends on mine, my grandfather and Maximilian. I will watch over them as I have over you. Well, sir, do as you will with me. And then she added in a low voice, Oh, heavens, what will befall me? Whatever may happen, Valentine, do not be alarmed, though you suffer. Though you lose sight, hearing, consciousness, fear nothing. Though you should awake and be ignorant where you are, still do not fear. Even though you should find yourself in a sepulchral vault or coffin, reassure yourself then and say to yourself, At this moment, a friend, a father, who lives for my happiness and that of Maximilian, watches over me. Alas! Alas, what a fearful extremity! Valentine, would you rather denounce your stepmother? I would rather die a hundred times. Oh, yes, die. No, you will not die. But will you promise me, whatever happens, that you will not complain, but hope? I will think of Maximilian. You are my own darling child, Valentine. I alone can save you, and I will. Valentine, in the extremity of her terror, joined her hands, for she felt that the moment had arrived to ask for courage, and began to pray. And while uttering little more than incoherent words, she forgot that her white shoulders had no other covering than her long hair, and that the pulsations of her heart could be seen through the lace of her nightdress. Monte Cristo gently laid his hand on the young girl's arm, drew the velvet coverlet close to her throat, and said with a paternal smile, My child, believe in my devotion to you as you believe in the goodness of Providence and the love of Maximilian. Then he drew from his waistcoat pocket the little emerald box, raised the golden lid, and took from it a pastille about the size of a pea, which he placed in her hand. She took it and looked attentively on the Count. There was an expression on the face of her intrepid protector which commanded her veneration. She evidently interrogated him by her look. Yes, said he. Valentine carried the pastille to her mouth and swallowed it. And now, my dear child, adieu for the present. I will try and gain a little sleep, for you are saved. Go, said Valentine. Whatever happens, I promise you not to fear. 
Monte Cristo, for some time, kept his eyes fixed on the young girl who gradually fell asleep, yielding to the effects of the narcotic the Count had given her. Then he took the glass, emptied three parts of the contents in the fireplace, that it might be supposed Valentine had taken it, and replaced it on the table. Then he disappeared after throwing a farewell glance on Valentine, who slept with the confidence and innocence of an angel. End of chapter 101Chapter 102 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 102 Valentine. The night light continued to burn on the chimney piece, exhausting the last drops of oil which floated on the surface of the water. The globe of the lamp appeared of a reddish hue, and the flame, brightening before it expired, threw out the last flickerings which an inanimate object have been so often compared with the convulsions of a human creature in its final agonies. A dull and dismal light was shed over the bedclothes and curtains surrounding the young girl. All noise in the streets had ceased, and the silence was frightful. It was then that the door of Edward's room opened, and a head we have before noticed appeared in the glass opposite. It was Madame de Villefort who came to witness the effects of the drink she had prepared. She stopped in the doorway, listened for a moment to the flickering of the lamp, the only sound in that deserted room, and then advanced to the table to see if Valentine's glass was empty. It was still about a quarter full, as we before stated. Madame de Villefort emptied the contents into the ashes, which she disturbed that they might the more readily absorb the liquid. Then she carefully rinsed the glass, and wiping it with her handkerchief, replaced it on the table. If anyone could have looked into the room just then, he would have noticed the hesitation with which Madame de Villefort approached the bed and looked fixedly on Valentine. The dim light, the profound silence, and the gloomy thoughts inspired by the hour, and still more by her own conscience, all combined to produce a sensation of fear. The prisoner was terrified at the contemplation of her own work. At length, she rallied, drew aside the curtain, and leaning over the pillow, gazed intently on Valentine. The young girl no longer breathed. No breath issued through the half-closed teeth. The white lips no longer quivered. The eyes were suffused with a bluish vapour, and the long black lashes rested on a cheek white as wax. Madame de Villefort gazed upon the face so expressive even in its stillness. Then she ventured to raise the coverlet, and press her hand upon the young girl's heart. It was cold and motionless. She only felt the pulsation in her own fingers and withdrew her hand with a shudder. One arm was hanging out of the bed, from shoulder to elbow it was moulded after the arms of Germain Pilon's graces. But the forearm seemed to be slightly distorted by convulsion, and the hand so delicately formed was resting with stiff, outstretched fingers on the framework of the bed. The nails, too, were turning blue. Madame de Villefort had no longer any doubt. All was over. She had consummated the last terrible work she had to accomplish. There was no more to do in the room, so the poisoner retired stealthily, as though fearing to hear the sound of her own footsteps. But as she was true, she still held aside the curtain, absorbed in the irresistible attraction always exerted by the picture of death so long as it is merely mysterious and does not excite disgust. Just then, the lamp again flickered. The noise startled Madame de Villefort, who shuddered and dropped the curtain. Immediately afterwards, the light expired, and the room was plunged in frightful obscurity, while the clock at that minute struck half-past four. Overpowered with agitation, the poisoner succeeded in groping her way to the door and reached her room in an agony of fear. The darkness lasted two hours longer. Then by degrees a cold light crept through the Venetian blinds, until at length it revealed the objects in the room. About this time the nurse's cough was heard on the stairs, and the woman entered the room with a cup in her hand. To the tender eye of a father or a lover, the first glance would have sufficed to reveal Valentine's condition, but to this hireling Valentine only appeared to sleep. 
good, she exclaimed, approaching the table. She has taken part of her draught. The glass is three quarters empty. Then she went to the fireplace and lit the fire. And although she had just left her bed, she could not resist the temptation offered by Valentine's sleep, so she threw herself into an armchair to snatch a little more rest. The clock striking eight awoke her. Astonished at the prolonged slumber of the patient and frightened to see that the arm was still hanging out of the bed, she advanced towards Valentine and for the first time noticed the white lips. She tried to replace the arm, but it moved with a frightful rigidity which could not deceive a sick nurse. She screamed aloud and running to the door exclaimed, Help! Help! What is the matter? asked Monsieur d'Avrigny at the foot of the stairs, it being the hour he usually visited her. "'What is it?' asked Villefort, rushing from his room. "'Doctor, do you hear them call for help?' "'Yes, yes. Let us hasten up. It was in Valentine's room.' But before the doctor and the father could reach the room, the servants who were on the same floor had entered, and seeing Valentine pale and motionless on her bed, they lifted up their hands towards heaven and stood transfixed as though struck by lightning. "'Call Madame de Villefort!' "'Wake, Madame de Villefort!' cried the procureur from the door of his chamber, which apparently he scarcely dared to leave. But instead of obeying him, the servant stood watching Monsieur d'Avrigny, who ran to Valentine and raised her in his arms. "'What? This one too?' he exclaimed. "'Oh, where will be the end?' Villefort rushed into the room. "'What are you saying, doctor?' he exclaimed, raising his hands to heaven. I say that Valentine is dead, replied d'Avrigny in a voice terrible in its solemn calm. Monsieur de Villefort staggered and buried his head in the bed. On the exclamation of the doctor and the cry of the father, the servants all fled with muttered imprecations. They were heard running down the stairs and through the long passages. Then there was a rush in the court. Afterwards all was still. They had one and all deserted the accursed house. Just then, Madame de Villefort, in the act of slipping on her dressing gown, threw aside the drapery, and for a moment stood motionless, as though interrogating the occupants of the room, while she endeavoured to call up some rebellious tears. On a sudden, she stepped, or rather bounded, with outstretched arms towards the table. She saw Davrigny curiously examining the glass which she felt certain of having emptied during the night. It was now a third full, just as it was when she threw the contents into the ashes. The spectre of Valentine rising before the poisoner would have alarmed her less. It was indeed the same colour as the draught she had poured into the glass and which Valentine had drunk. It was indeed the poison which could not deceive Monsieur Davrigny, which he now examined so closely. It was doubtless a miracle from heaven that notwithstanding her precautions there should be some trace, some proof remaining to reveal the crime. While Madame de Villefort remained rooted to the spot like a statue of terror, and Villefort, with his head hidden in the bedclothes, saw nothing around him, d'Avrigny approached the window that he might better examine the contents of the glass, and dipping the tip of his finger in, tasted it. Ah! he exclaimed. It is no longer Broussine that is used. Let me see what it is. Then he ran to one of the cupboards in Valentine's room, which had been transformed into a medicine closet, and taking from its silver case a small bottle of nitric acid, dropped a little of it into the liquor, which immediately changed to a blood-red colour. Ah! exclaimed d'Avrigny, in a voice in which the horror of a judge unveiling the truth was mingled with the delight of a student making a discovery. Madame de Villefort was overpowered. Her eyes first flashed and then swam. She staggered towards the door and disappeared. Directly afterwards, the distant sound of a heavy weight falling on the ground was heard, but no one paid any attention to it. The nurse was engaged in watching the chemical analysis, and Villefort was still absorbed in grief. Monsieur d'Avrigny alone, had followed Madame de Villefort with his eyes and watched her hurried retreat. He lifted up the drapery over the entrance to Edward's room, and his eye reaching as far as Madame de Villefort's apartment. He beheld her 
extended lifeless on the floor. "'Go to the assistance of Madame de Villefort,' he said to the nurse. "'Madame de Villefort is ill.' "'But Mademoiselle de Villefort,' stammered the nurse. "'Mademoiselle de Villefort no longer requires help,' said Davrigny, "'since she is dead.' "'Dead! Dead!' groaned forth Villefort, in a paroxysm of grief, which was the more terrible from the novelty of the sensation in the iron heart of that man. "'Dead?' repeated a third voice. "'Who said Valentine was dead?' The two men turned round, and saw Morel standing at the door, pale and terror-stricken. This is what had happened. At the usual time, Morel had presented himself at the little door leading to Noirtier's room. Contrary to custom, the door was open, and having no occasion to ring, he entered. He waited for a moment in the hall and called for a servant to conduct him to Monsieur Noirtier, but no one answered, the servants having, as we know, deserted the house. Morel had no particular reason for uneasiness. Monte Cristo had promised him that Valentine should live and so far he had always fulfilled his word. Every night the Count had given him news, which was the next morning confirmed by Noirtier. Still, this extraordinary silence appeared strange to him, and he called a second and third time. Still no answer. Then he determined to go up. Noirtier's room was opened like all the rest. The first thing he saw was the old man sitting in his armchair in his usual place, but his eyes expressed alarm which was confirmed by the pallor which overspread his features. "'How are you, sir?' asked Morel with a sickness of heart. "'Well,' answered the old man by closing his eyes, but his appearance manifested increasing uneasiness. "'You are thoughtful, sir,' continued Morel. "'You want something. Shall I call one of the servants?' "'Yes,' replied Noirtier. Morel pulled the bell, but though he nearly broke the cord, no one answered. He turned towards Noirtier. The pallor and anguish expressed on his countenance momentarily increased. "'Oh!' exclaimed Morel. "'Why do they not come? Is anyone ill in the house?' The eyes of Noirtier seemed as though they would start from their sockets. "'What is the matter? You alarm me! Valentine! Valentine!' "'Yes, yes,' signed Noirtier. Maximilien tried to speak, but he could articulate nothing. He staggered and supported himself against the wainscot. Then he pointed to the door. "'Yes, yes, yes,' continued the old man. Maximilien rushed up the little staircase, while Noirtier's eyes seemed to say, "'Quicker, quicker!' In a minute, the young man darted through several rooms, till at length he reached Valentine's. There was no occasion to push the door. It was wide open. A sob was the only sound he heard. He saw, as though in a mist, a black figure kneeling and buried in a confused mass of white drapery. A terrible fear transfixed him. It was then he heard a voice exclaim, Valentine is dead! And another voice, which like an echo repeated, Dead! Dead! End of chapter 102。Chapter 103 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 103 Maximilien. Villefort rose, half ashamed of being surprised in such a paroxysm of grief. The terrible office he had held for twenty-five years had succeeded in making him more or less than man. His glance, at first wandering, fixed itself upon Morel. "'Who are you, sir?' he asked. "'That forget that this is not the manner to enter a house stricken with death. Go, sir, go!' But Morel remained motionless. He could not detach his eyes from that disordered bed and the pale corpse of the young girl who was lying on it. "'Go! Do you hear?' said Villefort, while Davrigny advanced to lead Morel out. Maximilien stared for a moment at the corpse, gazed all round the room, 
Then, upon the two men, he opened his mouth to speak, but finding it impossible to give utterance to the innumerable ideas that occupied his brain, he went out, thrusting his hands through his hair, in such a manner that Villefort and Darigny, for a moment diverted from the engrossing topic, exchanged glances which seemed to say, "'He is mad!' But in less than five minutes the staircase groaned beneath an extraordinary weight. Morel was seen carrying, with superhuman strength, the armchair containing Noirtier upstairs. When he reached the landing, he placed the armchair on the floor and rapidly rolled it into Valentine's room. This could only have been accomplished by means of unnatural strength supplied by powerful excitement. But the most fearful spectacle was Noirtier being pushed towards the bed, his face expressing all his meaning and his eyes supplying the want of every other faculty. That pale face and flaming glance appeared to Villefort like a frightful apparition. Each time he had been brought into contact with his father, something terrible had happened. "'See what they have done!' cried Morel, with one hand leaning on the back of the chair and the other extended towards Valentine. See, my father, see! Villefort drew back and looked with astonishment on the young man, who, almost a stranger to him, called Noirtier his father. At this moment, the whole soul of the old man seemed centred in his eyes, which became bloodshot. The veins of the throat swelled, his cheeks and temples became purple, as though he was struck with epilepsy. Nothing was wanting to complete this but the utterance of a cry and the cry issued from his pores, if we may thus speak, a cry frightful in its silence. D'Avrigny rushed towards the old man and made him inhale a powerful restorative. Sir, cried Morel, seizing the moist hand of the paralytic, they ask me who I am, and what right I have to be here. Oh, you know it, tell them, tell them! And the young man's voice was choked by sobs. As for the old man, his chest heaved with his panting respiration. One could have thought that he was undergoing the agonies preceding death. At length, happier than the young man, who sobbed without weeping, tears glistened in the eyes of Noirtier. "'Tell them,' said Morel in a hoarse voice, "'tell them that I am her betrothed. Tell them she was my beloved, my noble girl, my only blessing.' in the world. Tell them, oh, tell them that corpse belongs to me. The young man, overwhelmed by the weight of his anguish, fell heavily on his knees before the bed, which his fingers grasped with convulsive energy. D'Avrigny, unable to bear the sight of this touching emotion, turned away, and Villefort, without seeking any further explanation, and attracted towards him by the irresistible magnetism which draws us towards those who have loved the people for whom we mourn, extended his hand towards the young man. But Morel saw nothing. He had grasped the hand of Valentine, and, unable to weep, vented his agony in groans as he bit the sheets. For some time nothing was heard in that chamber but sobs, exclamations, and prayers. At length, Villefort, the most composed of all, spoke. Sir, said he to Maximilien, you say you loved Valentine, that you were betrothed to her. I knew nothing of this engagement of this love, yet I, her father, forgive you, for I see that your grief is real and deep, and besides my own sorrow it is too great for anger to find a place in my heart. But you see that the angel whom you hoped for has left this earth, she has nothing more to do with the adoration of men. Take a last farewell, sir, of her sad remains. Take the hand you expected to possess once more within your own, and then separate yourself from her forever. Valentine now requires only the ministrations of the priest. You are mistaken, sir, exclaimed Morel, raising himself on one knee, his heart pierced by a more acute pang than any he had yet felt. You are mistaken. Valentine, dying as she has, not only requires a priest, but an avenger. You, Monsieur de Villefort, send for the priest. I will be the avenger. What do you mean, sir? 
asked Villefort, trembling at the new idea inspired by the delirium of Morel. I tell you, sir, that two persons exist in you. The father has mourned sufficiently. Now let the procureur fulfil his office. The eyes of Noirtier glistened, and Davrigny approached. Gentlemen, said Morel, reading all that passed through the minds of the witnesses to the scene, I know what I am saying, and you know as well as I do what I am about to say. Valentine has been assassinated. Villefort hung his head. Davrigny approached nearer, and Noirtier said yes with his eyes. Now, sir, continued Morel, in these days no one can disappear by violent means without some inquiries being made as to the cause of her disappearance. Even were she not a young, beautiful and adorable creature like Valentine, Monsieur Procureur, said Morel with increasing vehemence, no mercy is allowed. I denounce the crime. It is your place to seek the assassin. The young man's implacable eyes interrogated Villefort, who on his side glanced from Noirtier to Darigny, but instead of finding sympathy in the eyes of the doctor and his father, he only saw an expression as inflexible as that of Maximilian. Yes, indicated the old man. Assuredly, said Darigny. Sir, said Villefort, striving to struggle against this triple force and his own emotion, Sir, you are deceived. No one commits crimes here. I am stricken by fate. It is horrible indeed, but no one assassinates. The eyes of Noirtier lighted up with rage, and Davrigny prepared to speak. Morel, however, extended his arm and commanded silence. And I say that murders are committed here, said Morel, whose voice, though lower in tone, lost none of its terrible distinctness. I tell you that this is the fourth victim within the last four months. I tell you Valentine's life was attempted by poison four days ago, though she escaped, owing to the precautions of Monsieur Noirtier. I tell you that the dose has been double, the poison changed, and that this time it has succeeded. I tell you that you know these things as well as I do, since this gentleman has forewarned you, both as doctor and as a friend. "'Oh, you rave, sir!' exclaimed Villefort, in vain endeavouring to escape the net in which he was taken. "'I rave?' said Morel. "'Well, then, I appeal to Monsieur Davrigny himself. Ask him, sir, if he recollects the words he uttered in the garden of this house on the night of Madame de saint Méran's death. You thought yourselves alone, and talked about that tragical death.' and the fatality you mentioned then is the same which has caused the murder of Valentine. Villefort and Davrigny exchanged looks. Yes, yes, continued Morel, recall the scene, for the words you thought were only given to silence and solitude fell into my ears. Certainly, after witnessing the culpable indolence manifested by Monsieur de Villefort towards his own relations, I ought to have denounced him to the authorities. Then I should not have been an accomplice to thy death, as I now am. Sweet, beloved Valentine, but the accomplice shall become the avenger. This fourth murder is apparent to all, and if thy father abandon thee, Valentine, it is I, and I swear it, that shall pursue the assassin. And this time, as though nature had at least taken compassion on the vigorous frame, nearly bursting with its own strength, the words of Morel were stifled in his throat. His breast heaved, the tears so long rebellious gushed from his eyes, and he threw himself weeping on his knees by the side of the bed. Then Davrigny spoke. And I too, he exclaimed in a low voice, I unite with Monsieur Morel in demanding justice for crime, my blood boils at the idea of having encouraged a murderer by my cowardly concession. Oh, merciful heavens, murmured Villefort. Morel raised his head, and reading the eyes of the old man which gleamed with unnatural luster. Stay, he said. Monsieur Noirtier wishes to speak. Yes, 
indicated Noirtier with an expression the more terrible from all his faculties being centred in his glance. "'Do you know the assassin?' asked Morel. "'Yes,' replied Noirtier. "'And will you direct us?' exclaimed the young man. "'Listen, Monsieur d'Avrigny, listen!' Noirtier looked upon Morel with one of those melancholy smiles which had so often made Valentine happy, and thus fixed his attention. Then, having riveted the eyes of his interlocutor on his own, he glanced towards the door. "'Do you wish me to leave?' said Morel, sadly. "'Yes,' replied Noirtier. "'Alas! Alas, sir! Have pity on me!' The old man's eyes remained fixed on the door. "'May I at least return?' asked Morel. Yes. Must I leave alone? No. Whom am I to take with me? The procureur? No. The doctor? Yes. You wish to remain alone with Monsieur de Villefort? Yes. But can he understand you? Yes. Oh, said Villefort, inexpressibly delighted to think that the inquiries were to be made by him alone. Oh, be satisfied. I can understand my father. D'Avrigny took the young man's arm and led him out of the room. A more than death-like silence then reigned in the house. At the end of a quarter of an hour, a faltering footstep was heard, and Villefort appeared at the door of the apartment where D'Avrigny and Morel had been staying one absorbed in meditation, the other in grief. "'You can come,' he said, and led them back to Noirtier. Morel looked attentively on Villefort. His face was livid, large drops rolled down his face, and in his fingers he held the fragments of a quill pen which he had torn to atoms. "'Gentlemen,' he said in a hoarse voice, "'give me your word of honour." that this horrible secret shall forever remain buried amongst ourselves. The two men drew back. I entreat you, continued Villefort. But, said Morel, the culprit, the murderer, the assassin. Do not alarm yourself, sir. Justice will be done, said Villefort. My father has revealed the culprit's name. My father thirsts for revenge as much as you do, Yet even he conjures you as I do to keep this secret. Do you not, father? Yes, resolutely replied Noirtier. Morel suffered an exclamation of horror and surprise to escape him. Oh, sir, said Villefort, arresting Maximilien by the arm. If my father, the inflexible man, makes this request, it is because he knows, be assured, that Valentine will be terribly revenged. Is it not so, father? The old man made a sign in the affirmative. Villefort continued. He knows me, and I have pledged my word to him. Rest assured, gentlemen, that within three days, in a less time than justice would demand, the revenge I shall have taken for the murder of my child will be such as to make the boldest heart tremble. And as he spoke these words, he ground his teeth and grasped the old man's senseless hand. "'Will this promise be fulfilled, Monsieur Noirtier?' asked Morel, while Davrigny looked inquiringly. "'Yes,' replied Noirtier with an expression of sinister joy. "'Swear, then,' said Villefort, joining the hands of Morel and Davrigny. "'Swear that you will spare the honour of my house.' and leave me to avenge my child. D'Avrigny turned round and uttered a very feeble, Yes. But Morel, disengaging his hand, rushed to the bed, and after having pressed the cold lips of Valentine with his own, hurriedly left, uttering a long, deep groan of despair and anguish. We have before stated that all the servants had fled. Monsieur de Villefort was therefore obliged to request Monsieur d'Avrigny, to superintend all the arrangements consequent upon a death in a large city, more especially a death under such suspicious circumstances. It was something terrible to witness the silent agony, the mute despair of Noirtier, 
whose tears silently rolled down his cheeks. Villefort retired to his study, and d'Avrigny left to summon the doctor of the mayoralty, whose office it is to examine bodies after decease, and who is expressly named the Doctor of the Dead. Monsieur Noirtier could not be persuaded to quit his grandchild. At the end of a quarter of an hour, Monsieur d'Avrigny returned with his associate. They found the outer gate closed, and not a servant remaining in the house. Villefort himself was obliged to open to them. But he stopped on the landing. He had not the courage to again visit the death chamber. The two doctors, therefore, entered the room alone. Noirtier was near the bed, pale, motionless and silent as the corpse. The district doctor approached with the indifference of a man accustomed to spend half his time amongst the dead. He then lifted the sheet which was placed over the face, and just unclosed the lips. Alas, said d'Avrigny, she is indeed dead, poor child. Yes, answered the doctor laconically, dropping the sheet he had raised. Noirtier uttered a kind of hoarse, rattling sound. The old man's eyes sparkled, and the good doctor understood that he wished to behold his child. He therefore approached the bed, and while his companion was dipping the fingers with which he had touched the lips of the corpse in chloride of lime, he uncovered the calm and pale face, which looked like that of a sleeping angel. A tear, which appeared in the old man's eye, expressed his thanks to the doctor. The doctor of the dead then laid his permit on the corner of the table, and, having fulfilled his duty, was conducted out by d'Avrigny. Villefort met them at the door of his study. Having, in a few words, thanked the district doctor, he turned to d'Avrigny and said, And now the priest. Is there any particular priest you wish to pray with Valentine? asked d'Avrigny. No, said Villefort. Fetch the nearest. The nearest, said the district doctor, is a good Italian abbe who lives next door to you. Shall I call on him as I pass? D'Avrigny, said Villefort, be so kind, I beseech you as to accompany this gentleman. Here is the key of the door, so that you can go in and out as you please. You will bring the priest with you, and will oblige me by introducing him into my child's room. Do you wish to see him? I only wish to be alone. You will excuse me, will you not? A priest can understand a father's grief. And Monsieur de Villefort giving the key to d'Avrigny, again bade farewell to the strange doctor and retired to his study, where he began to work. For some temperaments, work is a remedy for all afflictions. As the doctors entered the street, they saw a man in a cassock standing on the threshold of the next door. "'This is the abbé of whom I spoke,' said the doctor to d'Avrigny. D'Avrigny accosted the priest. "'Sir,' he said, are you disposed to confer a great obligation to an unhappy father who has just lost his daughter? I mean Monsieur de Villefort, the king's attorney. Ah, said the priest in a marked Italian accent, yes, I have heard that the death is in that house. Then I need not tell you what kind of service he requires of you. I was about to offer myself, sir, said the priest. It is our mission to forestall our duties. It is a young girl. I know it, sir. The servants who fled from the house informed me. I also know that her name is Valentine, and I have already prayed for her. Thank you, sir, said d'Avrigny. Since you have commenced your sacred office, deign to continue it. Come and watch by the dead, and all the wretched family will be grateful to you. I am going, sir, and I do not hesitate to say that no prayers will be more fervent than mine. D'Avrigny took the priest's hand, and without meeting Villefort, who was engaged in his study, they reached Valentine's room, which on the following night was to be occupied by the undertakers. On entering the room, Noirtier's eyes met those of the abbé, and no doubt he read some particular expression in them for he remained in the room. D'Avrigny recommended the attention of the priest to the living as well as to the dead. 
and the abbé promised to devote his prayers to Valentine and his attentions to Noirtier, in order, doubtless, that he might not be disturbed while fulfilling his sacred mission, the priest rose as soon as d'Avrigny departed, and not only bolted the door through which the doctor had just left, but also that leading to Madame de Villefort's room. End of chapter 103「Of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 104 Donglar's Signature. The next morning dawned dull and cloudy. During the night, the undertakers had executed their melancholy office and wrapped the corpse in the winding sheet, which, whatever may be said about the equality of death, is at least a last proof of the luxury so pleasing in life. This winding sheet was nothing more than a beautiful piece of cambric which the young girl had bought a fortnight before. During the evening two men, engaged for the purpose, had carried Noirtier from Valentine's room into his own, and contrary to all expectation there was no difficulty in withdrawing him from his child. The Abbé Boussoni had watched till daylight, and then left without calling anyone. D'Avrigny returned about eight o'clock in the morning. He met Villefort on his way to Noirtier's room, and accompanied him to see how the old man had slept. They found him in the large armchair which served him for a bed, enjoying a calm, nay, almost a smiling sleep. They both stood in amazement at the door. See, si, said D'Avrigny to Villefort, Nature knows how to alleviate the deepest sorrow. No one can say that Monsieur Noirtier did not love his child, and yet he sleeps. Yes, you are right, replied Villefort, surprised. He sleeps, indeed, and this is the most strange, since the least contradiction keeps him awake all night. Grief has stunned him, replied D'Avrigny, and they both returned thoughtfully to the procureur's study. See, I have not slept said Villefort, showing his undisturbed bed. Grief does not stun me. I have not been in bed for two nights. But then look at my desk. See what I have written during these two days and nights. I have filled those papers and have made out the accusation against the assassin Benedetto. Oh, work, work! My passion, my joy, my delight! It is for thee to alleviate my sorrows. And he convulsively grasped the hand of D'Avrigny. "'Do you require my services now?' asked D'Avrigny. "'No,' said Villefort. "'Only return again at eleven o'clock. "'At twelve the—oh, the, heavens, my poor, poor child!' "'And the procureur again, becoming a man, "'lifted up his eyes and groaned. "'Shall you be present in the reception room?' "'No, I have a cousin who has undertaken this sad office. "'I shall work, doctor.' When I work, I forget everything. And indeed, no sooner had the doctor left the room than he was again absorbed in study. On the doorsteps, D'Avrigny met the cousin whom Villefort had mentioned, a personage as insignificant in our story as in the world he occupied, one of those beings designed from their birth to make themselves useful to others. He was punctual, dressed in black, with crape around his hat, and presented himself at his cousin's with a face made up for the occasion, and which he could alter as might be required. At twelve o'clock, the morning coaches rolled into the paved court, and the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré was filled with a crowd of idlers, equally pleased to witness the festivities or the mourning of the rich, and who rush with the same avidity to a funeral procession as to the marriage of a duchess. Gradually the reception room filled, and some of our old friends made their appearance. We mean Debray, Chateau Renaud, and Beauchamp, accompanied by all the leading men of the day at the bar, in literature or the army. For Monsieur de Villefort moved in the first Parisian circles, less owing to his social position than to his personal merit. The cousin, standing at the door, ushered in the guests, and it was rather a relief to the indifferent to see a person as unmoved as themselves, 
and who did not exact a mournful face or forced tears, as would have been the case with a father, a brother, or a lover. Those who were acquainted soon formed into little groups. One of them was made of Debray, Chateau Renaud, and Beauchamp. Poor girl, said Debray, like the rest, paying an involuntary tribute to the sad event. Poor girl, so young, so rich, so beautiful. Could you have imagined this scene, Chateau Renaud, when we saw her at the most three weeks ago, about to sign that contract? Indeed no, said Chateau Renaud. Did you know her? I spoke to her once or twice at Madame de Morcerf's, among the rest. She appeared to me charming, though rather melancholy. Where is her stepmother? Do you know? She is spending the day with the wife of the worthy gentleman who is receiving us. Who is he? Whom do you mean? The gentleman who receives us. Is he a deputy? Oh, no, I am condemned to witness those gentlemen every day, said Beauchamp, but he is perfectly unknown to me. Have you mentioned this death in your paper? It has been mentioned, but the article is not mine, indeed. I doubt if it would please Monsieur Villefort, for it says that if four successive deaths had happened anywhere else than in the house of the king's attorney, he would have interested himself somewhat more about it. Still, said Chateau Renaud, Miss Dr. Davrigny, who attends my mother, declares he is in despair about it. But whom are you seeking, de Bray? I am seeking the Count of Monte Cristo, said the young man. I met him on the boulevard on my way here, said Beauchamp. I think he is about to leave Paris. He was going to his banker. His banker? Donglar is his banker, is he not? asked Chateau Renaud of de Bray. I believe so, replied the secretary with slight uneasiness. But Monte Cristo is not the only one I miss here. I do not see Morel. Morel? Do they know him? asked Chateau Renaud. I think he has only been introduced to Madame de Villefort. Still, he ought to have been here, said de Bray. I wonder what will be talked about tonight. This funeral is the news of the day. But hush, here comes our minister of justice. He will feel obliged to make some little speech to the cousin and the three young men drew near to listen. Beauchamp told the truth when he said that on his way to the funeral he had met Monte Cristo, who was directing his steps towards the Rue de la Chausse d'Antin, to Monsieur Donglard. The banker saw the carriage of the Count enter the courtyard and advanced to meet him with a sad, though affable, smile. Well, said he, extending his hand to Monte Cristo, I suppose you have come to sympathize with me, for indeed the misfortune has taken possession of my house. When I perceived you, I was just asking myself whether I had not wished harm towards those poor Morcerf, which would have justified the proverb of He who wishes misfortunes to happen to others experiences them himself. Well, on my word of honour, I answered no. I wished no ill to Morcerf. He was a little proud, perhaps, for a man who, like myself, has risen from nothing. But we all have our faults. Do you know, Count, that persons of our time of life, not that you belong to the class, you are still a young man, but, as I was saying, persons of our time of life have been very unfortunate this year. For example, look at the puritanical procureur, who has just lost his daughter and, in fact, nearly all his family, in so singular a manner. Morcerf, dishonoured and dead, and then myself covered with ridicule through the villainy of Benedetto. Besides... Besides what? asked the Count. Alas, you do not know. What new calamity? My daughter. Mademoiselle Danglars. Eugenie has left us. Good heavens, what are you telling me? The truth, my dear Count. Oh, how happy you must be in not having either wife or children. Do you think so? Indeed I do. And so, Mademoiselle Danglars? She could not endure the insult offered to us by that wretch. So she asked permission to travel. And is she gone? The other night she left. With Madame Danglars? No, with her relation. But still, we have quite lost our dear Eugenie, 
for I doubt whether her pride will ever allow her to return to France. Still, Baron, said Monte Cristo, family griefs, or indeed any other affliction, which would crush a man whose child was his only treasure, are endurable to a millionaire. Philosophers may well say, and practical men will always support the opinion, that money mitigates many trials, and if you admit the efficacy of this sovereign balm, you ought to be very easily consoled. You, the king of finance, the focus of immeasurable power. Danglars looked at him askance, as though to ascertain whether he spoke seriously. Yes, he answered, if her fortune brings consolation, I ought to be consoled. I am rich. So rich, dear sir, that your fortune resembles the pyramids. If you wished to demolish them, you could not, and if it were possible, you would not dare. Donglar smiled at the good-natured pleasantry of the Count. That reminds me, he said, that when you entered, I was on the point of signing five little bonds. I have already signed two. Will you allow me to do the same to the others? Pray do so. There was a moment's silence during which the noise of the banker's pen was alone heard, while Monte Cristo examined the gilt mouldings on the ceiling. Are they Spanish, Haitian, or Neapolitan bonds? said Monte Cristo. No, said Danglars, smiling. They are bonds on the Bank of France, payable to bearer. Stay, Count, he added. You who may be called the Emperor, if I claim the title of King of Finance, have you many pieces of paper of this size, each worth a million? The Count took into his hands the papers which Danglars had so proudly presented to him, and read, To the Governor of the Bank, please pay to my order from the fund deposited by me the sum of a million and charge the same to my account. Baron Danglars One, two, three, four, five, said Monte Cristo. Five millions. Why, what a crisis you are. This is how I transact business, said Danglars. It is really wonderful, said the Count. Above all, if, as I suppose, it is payable at sight. It is indeed, said Danglars. It is a fine thing to have such credit. Really, it is only in France these things are done. Five millions on five little scraps of paper. It must be seen to be believed. You do not doubt it? No. You say so with an accent. Stay. You shall be convinced. Take my clerk to the bank and you will see him leave it with an order on the treasury for the same sum. No, said Monte Cristo, folding the five notes. Most decidedly not. The thing is so curious, I will make the experiment myself. I am credited on you for six millions. I have drawn nine hundred thousand francs. You therefore still owe me five millions and a hundred thousand francs. I will take the five scraps of paper that I now hold as bonds, with your signature alone, and here is a receipt in full for the six millions between us. I had prepared it beforehand, for I am much in want of money today. And Monte Cristo placed the bonds in his pocket with one hand, while with the other he held out the receipt to Donglar. If a thunderbolt had fallen at the banker's feet, he could not have experienced greater terror. What? he stammered. Do you mean to keep that money? Excuse me, excuse me, but I owe this money to the charity fund, a deposit which I promised to pay this morning. Oh, well then, said Monte Cristo, I am not particular about these five notes. Pay me in a different form. I wished from curiosity to take these that I might be able to say that, without any advice or preparation, the house of Donglar had paid me five millions without a minute's delay. It would have been remarkable. But here are your bonds. Pay me differently. And he held the bonds towards Donglar, who seized them like a vulture extending its claws to withhold the food that is being wrested from its grasp. Suddenly he rallied 
made a violent effort to restrain himself, and then a smile gradually widened the features of his disturbed countenance. Certainly, he said. Your receipt is money. Oh, dear, yes. And if you were at Rome, the house of Thompson and French would make no more difficulty about paying the money on my receipt than you have just done. Pardon me, Count. Pardon me. Then I may keep this money. Yes, said Danglars, while the perspiration started from the roots of his hair. Yes, keep it. Keep it. Monte Cristo replaced the notes in his pocket, with that indescribable expression which seemed to say, Come, reflect. If you repent, there is still time. No, said Danglars. No, decidedly no. Keep my signatures. But you know none are so formal as bankers in transacting business. I intended this money for the charity fund, and I seem to be robbing them if I did not pay them with these precise bonds. How absurd! As if one crown were not as good as another. Excuse me. And he began to laugh loudly, but nervously. Certainly I excuse you, said Monte Cristo graciously, and pocket them. And he placed the bonds in his pocket book. But, said Danglars, there is still a sum of one hundred thousand francs. Oh, a mere nothing, said Monte Cristo. The balance would come to about that sum, but keep it, and we shall be quits. Count, said Danglars, are you speaking seriously? I never joke with bankers, said Monte Cristo in a freezing manner, which repelled impertinence, and he turned to the door just as the valet de chambre announced, Monsieur de Beauville, receiver general of the charities. Ma foi, said Monte Cristo, I think I arrived just in time to obtain your signatures, or they would have been disputed with me. Danglars again became pale, and hastened to conduct the count out. Monte Cristo exchanged a ceremonious bow with Monsieur de Beauville, who was standing in the waiting room, and who was introduced into Danglars' room as soon as the Count had left. The Count's sad face was illumined by a faint smile as he noticed the portfolio which the Receiver-General held in his hand. At the door he found his carriage, and was immediately driven to the bank. Meanwhile, Danglars, repressing all emotion, advanced to meet the Receiver-General. We need not say that a smile of condescension was stamped upon his lips. "'Good morning, creditor,' said he. "'For I wager anything it is the creditor who visits me.' "'You are right, Baron,' answered Monsieur de Beauville. "'The charities present themselves to you through me. "'The widows and orphans depute me "'to receive alms to the amount of five millions from you.' "'And yet they say orphans are to be pitied,' said Danglars, wishing to prolong the jest. "'Poor things! "'Here I am in their name,' said Monsieur de Beauville. "'But uh, did you receive my letter yesterday?' "'Yes.' "'I have brought my receipt.' "'My dear Monsieur de Beauville, "'your widows and orphans must oblige me by waiting twenty-four hours.' Since Monsieur de Monte Cristo, whom you just saw leaving here, you did see him, I think. Yes, well? Well, Monsieur de Monte Cristo has just carried off their five millions. How so? The Count has an unlimited credit upon me, a credit opened by Thompson and French of Rome. He came to demand five millions at once, which I paid him with cheques on the bank. My funds are deposited there. And you can understand that if I draw out ten millions on the same day, it will appear rather strange to the governor. Two days will be a different thing, said Danglars, smiling. Come, said Beauville with a tone of entire incredulity. Five millions to that gentleman who just left, and who bowed to me as though he knew me? Perhaps he knows you, though you do not know him. Monsieur de Monte Cristo knows everybody. Five million? Here is his receipt. Believe your own eyes. Monsieur de Beauville took the paper Danglars presented him and read. Received of Baron Danglars the sum of five million one hundred thousand francs, 
to be repaid on demand by the house of Thompson and French of Rome. It is really true, said Monsieur de Beauville. Do you know the house of Thompson and French? Yes, I once had business to transact with it to the amount of two hundred thousand francs. But since then I have not heard it mentioned. It is one of the best houses in Europe, said Danglars, carelessly throwing down the receipt on his desk. And he had five millions in your hands alone? Why, this Count of Monte Cristo must be a nabob. Indeed, I do not know what he is. He has three unlimited credits, one on me, one on Rothschild, and one on Lafitte. And, you see, he added carelessly, he has given me the preference by leaving a balance of one hundred thousand francs. Monsieur de Beauville manifested signs of extraordinary admiration. I must visit him, he said, and obtain some pious grant from him. Oh, you may be sure of him. His charities alone amount to twenty thousand francs a month. It is magnificent. I will set before him the example of Madame de Morcerf and her son. What example? They gave all their fortune to the hospitals. What fortune? Their own. Monsieur de Morcerf's, who is deceased. For what reason? Because they would not spend money so guiltily acquired. And what are they to live upon? The mother retires into the country, and the son enters the army. Well, I must confess, these are scruples. I registered their deed of gift yesterday. And how much did they possess? Oh, not much. From twelve to thirteen hundred thousand francs. But to return to our million. Certainly, said Danglars in the most natural tone in the world. Are you then pressed for this money? Yes, for the examination of our cash takes place tomorrow. Tomorrow? Why did you not tell me so before? Why, it is as good as a century. At what hour does the examination take place? At two o'clock. Send at twelve, said Danglars, smiling. Monsieur de Beauville said nothing, but nodded his head and took up the portfolio. Now I think of it. You can do better, said Danglars. How do you mean? The receipt of Monsieur de Monte Cristo is as good as money. Take it to Rothschild's or Lafitte's, and they would take it off your hands at once. What, through payable at Rome? Certainly. It will only cost you a discount of five thousand or six thousand francs. The receiver started back. Ma foi, he said. I prefer waiting till tomorrow. What a proposition! I thought, perhaps, said Danglars with supreme impertinence, that you had a deficiency to make up. Indeed, said the receiver. And if that were the case, it would be worth while to make some sacrifice. Thank you. No, sir. Then it will be tomorrow. Yes, but without fail. Ah, you are laughing at me. Send tomorrow at twelve, and the bank shall be notified. I will come myself. Better still, since it will afford me the pleasure of seeing you. They shook hands. By the way, said Monsieur de Beauville, are you not going to the funeral of poor Mademoiselle de Villefort, which I met on my road here? No, said the banker. I have appeared rather ridiculous since that affair of Benedetto, so I remain in the background. Bah, you are wrong. How were you to blame in that affair? Listen, when one bears an irreproachable name, as I do, one is rather sensitive. Everybody pities you, sir, and above all Mademoiselle Danglars. Poor Eugenie, said Danglars, do you know she is going to embrace a religious life? No. Alas, it is unhappily but too true. The day after the event, she decided on leaving Paris with a nun of her acquaintance. They are gone to seek a very strict convent in Italy or Spain. Oh, it is terrible! And Monsieur de Beauville retired with this exclamation, after expressing acute sympathy with the father. 
but he has scarcely left before Donglar, with an energy of action those can alone understand who have seen Robert Macaire, represented by Frédéric, exclaimed, Fool! Then enclosing Monte Cristo's receipt in a little pocket book, he added, Yes, come at twelve o'clock. I shall then be far away. Then he double locked his door, emptied all his drawers, collected about fifty thousand francs in banknotes, burned several papers, left others exposed to view, and then commenced writing a letter which he addressed to Madame la Baronne d'Anglars. I will place it on our table myself tonight, he murmured. Then, taking a passport from his drawer, he said, Good. It is available for two months longer. End of chapter 104「Chapter 105 of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 105 The Cemetery of Père Lachaise. Monsieur de Beauville had indeed met the funeral procession which was taking Valentine to her last home on earth. The weather was dull and stormy. A cold wind shook the few remaining yellow leaves from the boughs of the trees and scattered them among the crowd which filled the boulevards. Monsieur de Villefort, a true Parisian, considered the cemetery of Père Lachaise alone worthy of receiving the mortal remains of a Parisian family. There alone the corpses belonging to him would be surrounded by worthy associates. He had therefore purchased a vault, which was quickly occupied by members of his family, on the front of the monument was inscribed, The Families of saint Méran and Villefort, for such had been the last wish expressed by poor René, Valentine's mother. The pompous procession therefore wended its way towards Père Lachaise from the Faubourg Saint-Honoré. Having crossed Paris, it passed through the Faubourg du Temple, then leaving the exterior boulevards, it reached the cemetery. More than fifty private carriages followed the twenty mourning coaches, and behind them more than five hundred persons joined in the procession on foot. These last consisted of all the young people whom Valentine's death had struck like a thunderbolt, and who, notwithstanding the raw chilliness of the season, could not refrain from paying a last tribute to the memory of the beautiful, chaste, and adorable girl, thus cut off in the flower of her youth. As they left Paris, an equipage with four horses at full speed was seen to draw up suddenly. It contained Monte Cristo. The Count left the carriage and mingled in the crowd who followed on foot. Chateau Renaud perceived him, and immediately, alighting from his coupé, joined him. The Count looked attentively through every opening in the crowd. He was evidently watching for someone, but his search ended in disappointment. "'Where is Morel?' he asked. "'Do either of these gentlemen know where he is?' "'We have already asked that question,' said Chateau Renaud, "'for none of us has seen him.' The Count was silent, but continued to gaze around him. At length they arrived at the cemetery. The piercing eye of Monte Cristo glanced through clusters of bushes and trees, and was soon relieved from all anxiety. For seeing a shadow glide between the yew trees, Monte Cristo recognized him whom he sought. One funeral is generally very much like another in this magnificent metropolis. Black figures are seen scattered over the long white avenues. The silence of earth and heaven is alone broken by the noise made by the crackling branches of hedges planted around the monuments. Then follows the melancholy chant of the priests, mingled now and then with a sob of anguish, escaping from some woman concealed behind a mass of flowers. The shadow, Monte Cristo had noticed, passed rapidly behind the tomb of Abelard and Eloise, placed itself close to the heads of the horses belonging to the hearse, and following the undertaker's men, arrived with them at the spot appointed for the burial. Each person's attention was occupied. Monte Cristo saw nothing but the shadow which no one else observed. Twice the Count left the ranks to see whether the object of his interest 
had any concealed weapon beneath his clothes. When the procession stopped, this shadow was recognized as Morel, who with his coat buttoned up to his throat, his face livid and convulsively crushing his hat between his fingers, leaned against a tree situated on an elevation commanding the mausoleum, so that none of the funeral details could escape his observation. Everything was conducted in the usual manner. A few men, the least impressed of all by the scene, pronounced a discourse, some deploring this premature death, others expatiating on the grief of the father, and one very ingenious person quoting the fact that Valentine had solicited pardon of her father for criminals on whom the arm of justice was ready to fall, until at length they exhausted their stories of metaphor and mournful speeches. Monte Cristo heard and saw nothing, or rather he only saw Morel, whose calmness had a frightful effect on those who knew what was passing in his heart. Si, said Beauchamp, pointing out Morel to Debray, what is he doing up there? And they called Chateau Renaud's attention to him. How pale he is, said Chateau Renaud, shuddering. He is cold, said Debray. Not at all, said Chateau Renaud slowly. I think he is violently agitated. He is very susceptible. Bah, said Debray. He scarcely knew Mademoiselle de Villefort. You said so yourself. True. Still, I remember he danced three times with her at Madame de Morcerf's. Do you recollect that ball, Count, where you produced such an effect? No, I do not, replied Monte Cristo, without even knowing of what or to whom he was speaking. So much was he occupied in watching Morel, who was holding his breath with emotion. The discourse is over. Farewell, gentlemen, said the Count and he disappeared without anyone seeing whither he went. The funeral being over, the guests returned to Paris. Chateau Renaud looked for a moment for Morel, but while they were watching the departure of the Count, Morel had quitted his post, and Chateau Renaud, failing in his search, joined de Bray and Beauchamp. Monte Cristo concealed himself behind a large tomb, and awaited the arrival of Morel, who by degrees approached the tomb now abandoned by spectators and workmen. Morel threw a glance around, but before it reached the spot occupied by Monte Cristo, the latter had advanced yet nearer, still unperceived. The young man knelt down. The Count, with outstretched neck and glaring eyes, stood in an attitude ready to pounce upon Morel upon the first occasion. Morel bent his head, till it touched the stone. Then, clutching the grating with both hands, he murmured, "'Oh, Valentine!' The Count's heart was pierced by the utterance of these two words. He stepped forward, and touching the young man's shoulder, said, "'I was larking for you, my friend.' Monte Cristo expected a burst of passion, but he was deceived, for Morel turned round and said calmly, "'You see, I was praying.' The scrutinizing glance of the Count searched the young man from head to foot. He then seemed more easy. "'Shall I drive you back to Paris?' he asked. "'No, thank you. "'Do you wish for anything? "'Leave me to pray.' The Count withdrew without opposition, but it was only to place himself in a situation where he could watch every movement of Morel, who at length arose brushed the dust from his knees, and turned towards Paris, without once looking back. He walked slowly down the Rue de la Roquette. The Count, dismissing his carriage, followed him about a hundred paces behind. Maximilien crossed the canal and entered the Rue Millet by the boulevards. Five minutes after the door had been closed on Morel's entrance, it was again opened for the Count. Julie was at the entrance of the garden, where she was attentively watching Penelon, who, entering with zeal into his profession of gardener, was very busy grafting some Bengal roses. "'Ah, Count!' she exclaimed with the delight manifested by every member of the family whenever he visited the Rue Melee. "'Maximilian has just returned, has he not, madame?' asked the Count. "'Yes, I think I saw him pass. But pray, call Emmanuel.' 
"'Excuse me, madam, but I must go up to Maximilian's room this instant,' replied Monte Cristo. "'I have something of the greatest importance to tell him.' "'Go, then,' she said with a charming smile, which accompanied him until he had disappeared. Monte Cristo soon ran up the staircase conducting from the ground floor to Maximilian's room. When he reached the landing, he listened attentively, but all was still. Like many old houses occupied by a single family, the room door was panelled with glass, but it was locked. Maximilian was shut in, and it was impossible to see what was passing in the room, because a red curtain was drawn before the glass. The Count's anxiety was manifested by a bright colour which seldom appeared on the face of that imperturbable man. "'What shall I do?' he uttered, and reflected for a moment. "'Shall I ring?' No, the sound of a bell announcing a visitor will but accelerate the resolution of one in Maximilian's situation, and then the bell would be followed by a louder noise. Monte Cristo trembled from head to foot, and as if his determination had been taken with the rapidity of lightning, he struck one of the panes of glass with his elbow. The glass was shivered to atoms, then withdrawing the curtain, he saw Morel, who had been writing at his desk, bound from his seat at the noise of the broken window. "'I beg a thousand pardons,' said the Count. "'There is nothing the matter, but I slipped down and broke one of your panes of glass with my elbow. Since it is opened, I will take advantage of it to enter your room. Do not disturb yourself. Do not disturb yourself.' And passing his hand through the broken glass, the Count opened the door. Morel, evidently discomposed, came to meet Monte Cristo, less with the intention of receiving him than to exclude his entry. Ma foi, said Monte Cristo, rubbing his elbow, it's all your servant's fault. Your stairs are so polished, it is like walking on glass. Are you hurt, sir? coldly asked Morel. I believe not. But what are you about there? You were writing. I? Your fingers are stained with ink. Ah, true, I was writing. I do sometimes, soldier though I am. Monte Cristo advanced into the room. Maximilian was obliged to let him pass, but he followed him. You were writing? said Monte Cristo with a searching look. I have already had the honour of telling you I was, said Morel. The Count looked around him. Your pistols are beside your desk, said Monte Cristo pointing with his finger to the pistols on the table. "'I am on the point of starting on a journey,' replied Morel disdainfully. "'My friend,' exclaimed Monte Cristo, in a tone of exquisite sweetness. "'Sir?' "'My friend, my dear Maximilian, do not make a hasty resolution, I entreat you.' "'I make a hasty resolution?' said Morel, shrugging his shoulders. Is there anything extraordinary in a journey? Maximilian, said the Count, let us both lay aside the mask we have assumed. You no more deceive me with that false calmness than I impose upon you with my frivolous solicitude. You can understand, can you not, that to have acted as I've done, to have broken that glass, to have intruded on the solitude of a friend, you can understand that, to have done all this I must have been actuated by real uneasiness, or rather by a terrible conviction. Morel, you are going to destroy yourself. Indeed, Count, said Morel, shuddering, what has put this into your head? I tell you that you are about to destroy yourself, continued the Count, and here is proof of what I say. And approaching the desk, he removed the sheet of paper which Morel had placed over the letter he had begun, and took the latter in his hands. Morel rushed forward to tear it from him, but Monte Cristo, perceiving his intention, seized his wrist with his iron grasp. "'You wish to destroy yourself,' said the Count. "'You have written it.' "'Well,' said Morel, changing his expression of calmness for one of violence, "'well,' and if I do intend to turn this pistol against myself, who shall prevent me? 
Who will dare prevent me? All my hopes are blighted. My heart is broken, my life a burden, everything around me is sad and mournful. Earth has become distasteful to me, and human voices distract me. It is a mercy to let me die, for if I live I shall lose my reason and become mad. When, sir, I tell you all this with tears of heartfelt anguish, can you reply that I am wrong? Can you prevent my putting an end to my miserable existence? Tell me, sir, could you have the courage to do so? Yes, Morel, said Monte Cristo with a calmness which contrasted strangely with the young man's excitement. Yes, I would do so. You? exclaimed Morel with increasing anger and reproach. You, who have deceived me with false hopes, who have cheered and soothed me with vain promises, when I might, if not have saved her, at least have seen her die in my arms. You, who pretend to understand everything, even the hidden sources of knowledge, and who enact the part of a guardian angel upon earth, and could not even find an antidote to a poison administered to a young girl. Ah, sir, indeed you would inspire me with pity, were you not hateful in my eyes. Morel? Yes, you tell me to lay aside the mask, and I will do so. Be satisfied, when you spoke to me at the cemetery, I answered you. My heart was softened when you arrived here. I allowed you to enter. But since you abuse my confidence, since you have devised a new torture after I thought I had exhausted them all, then, Count of Monte Cristo, my pretended benefactor, then, Count of Monte Cristo, the universal guardian, be satisfied. You shall witness the death of your friend. And Morel, with a maniacal laugh, again rushed towards the pistols. And I again repeat, you shall not commit suicide. Prevent me, then, replied Morel with another struggle, which, like the first, failed in releasing him from the Count's iron grasp. I will prevent you. And who are you, then, that arrogate to yourself this tyrannical right over free and rational beings? Who am I? repeated Monte Cristo. Listen, I am the only man in the world having the right to say to you, Morel, your father's son shall not die today. And Monte Cristo, with an expression of majesty and sublimity, advanced with arms folded toward the young man, who involuntarily, overcome by the commanding manner of this man, recoiled a step. Why do you mention my father? stammered he. Why do you mingle a recollection of him with the affairs of today? because I am he who saved your father's life when he wished to destroy himself, as you do today, because I am the man who sent the purse to your young sister and the pharaoh to old Morel, because I am the Edmond Dante who nursed you, a child on my knees. Morel made another step back, staggering, breathless, crushed, then all his strength gave way, and he fell prostrate at the feet of Monte Cristo. Then his admirable nature underwent a complete and sudden revulsion. He arose, rushed out of the room and to the stairs, exclaiming energetically, Julie! Julie! Emmanuel! Emmanuel! Monte Cristo endeavoured also to leave, but Maximilien would have died rather than relax his hold of the handle of the door, which he closed upon the Count. Julie, Emmanuel, and some of the servants ran up in alarm on hearing the cries of Maximilien. Morel seized their hands, and opening the door exclaimed in a voice choked with sobs, On, on your knees! You, on your knees! He is our benefactor, the saviour of our father! He is! He would have added, Edmond Dante, but the Count seized his arm and prevented him. Julie threw herself into the arms of the Count. Emmanuel embraced him as a guardian angel. Morel again fell on his knees and struck the ground with his forehead. Then the iron-hearted man felt his heart swell in his breast. A flame seemed to rush from his throat to his eyes. He bent his head and wept. For a while nothing was heard in the room but a succession of sobs, while the incense from their grateful hearts mounted to heaven. 
Julie had scarcely recovered from her deep emotion when she rushed out of the room, descended to the next floor, ran into the drawing-room with childlike joy, and raised the crystal globe which covered the purse given by the unknown of the Allée de Meillan. Meanwhile, Emmanuel, in a broken voice, said to the Count, Oh, Count, how could you, hearing us so often speak of our unknown benefactor, seeing us pay such homage of gratitude and adoration to his memory, how could you continue so long without discovering yourself to us? Oh, it was cruel to us, and, dare I say it, to you also. Listen, my friends, said the Count. I may call you so, since we have really been friends for the last eleven years. The discovery of this secret has been occasioned by a great event, which you must never know. I wished to bury it during my whole life in my own bosom, but your brother Maximilian wrested it from me by a violence he repents of now, I am sure. Then turning around, and seeing that Morel, still on his knees, had thrown himself into an armchair, he added in a low voice, pressing Emmanuel's hand significantly, Watch over him. Why so? asked the young man, surprised. I cannot explain myself, but watch over him. Emmanuel looked around the room and caught sight of the pistols. His eyes rested on the weapons, and he pointed to them. Monte Cristo bent his head. Emmanuel went towards the pistols. Leave them, said Monte Cristo. Then walking towards Morel, he took his hand. The tumultuous agitation of the young man was succeeded by a profound stupor. Julie returned holding the silken purse in her hands while tears of joy rolled down her cheeks like dewdrops on the rose. "'Here is the relic,' she said. "'Do not think it would be less dear to us, now we are acquainted with our benefactor.' "'My child,' said Monte Cristo, colouring, "'allow me to take back that purse. Since you now know my face, I wish to be remembered alone through the affection I hope you will grant me.' Oh, said Julie, pressing the purse to her heart. No, no, I beseech you, do not take it, for some unhappy day you will leave us, will you not? You have guessed rightly, madame, replied Monte Cristo, smiling. In a week I shall have left this country, where so many persons who merit the vengeance of heaven lived happily, while my father perished of hunger and grief. While announcing his departure, the Count fixed his eyes on Morel, and remarked that the words, I shall have left this country, had failed to rouse him from his lethargy. He then saw that he must make another struggle against the grief of his friend, and taking the hands of Emmanuel and Julie, which he pressed within his own, he said with the mild authority of a father, My kind friends, leave me alone with Maximilian. Julie saw the means offered of carrying off her precious relic, which Monte Cristo had forgotten. She drew her husband to the door. "'Let us leave them,' she said. The Count was alone with Morel, who remained motionless as a statue. "'Come,' said Monte Cristo, touching his shoulder with his finger. "'Are you a man again, Maximilian?' "'Yes, for I begin to suffer again.' The Count frowned, apparently in gloomy hesitation. "'Maximilian, Maximilian,' he said, "'the ideas you yield to are unworthy of a Christian.' "'Oh, do not fear, my friend,' said Morel, raising his head and smiling with a sweet expression on the Count. "'I shall no longer attempt my life.' "'Then we are to have no more pistols, no more despair.' "'No.' I have found a better remedy for my grief than either a bullet or a knife. Poor fellow, what is it? My grief will kill me of itself. My friend, said Monte Cristo with an expression of melancholy equal to his own, listen to me. One day, in a moment of despair like yours, since it led to a similar resolution, 
I also wish to kill myself. One day your father, equally desperate, wished to kill himself too. If anyone had said to your father at the moment he raised a pistol to his head, if anyone had told me when in my prison I pushed back the food I had not tasted for three days, if anyone had said to either of us then, Live, the day will come when you will be happy and will bless life. No matter whose voice had spoken, we should have heard him with the smile of doubt or the anguish of incredulity, and yet how many times has your father blessed life while embracing you? How often have I myself... Ah! exclaimed Morel, interrupting the Count. You only lost your liberty. My father had only lost his fortune. But I have lost Valentine. Look at me, said Monte Cristo, with that expression which sometimes made him so eloquent and persuasive. Look at me. There are no tears in my eyes, nor is there fever in my veins. Yet I see you suffer, you, Maximilian, whom I love as my own son. Well, does not this tell you that in grief, as in life, there is always something to look forward to beyond? Now, if I entreat, if I order you to live, Morel, it is in the conviction that one day you will thank me for having preserved your life. Oh, heavens, said the young man, oh, heavens, what are you saying, Count? Take care, but perhaps you have never loved. Child, replied the Count, I mean as I love. You see, I have been a soldier ever since I attained manhood. I reached the age of twenty-nine without loving, for none of the feelings I before then experienced merit the appellation of love. Well, at twenty-nine I saw Valentine. For two years I have loved her. For two years I have seen written in her heart, as in a book, all the virtues of a daughter and wife. Count, to possess Valentine would have been a happiness too infinite, too ecstatic, too complete, too divine for this world, since it has been denied me. But without Valentine, the earth is desolate. I have told you to hope, said the Count. Then have a care, I repeat, for you seek to persuade me, and if you succeed, I shall lose my reason, for I should hope that I could again be old Valentine. The Count smiled. My friend, my father, said Morel with excitement, have a care, I again repeat. For the power you wield over me alarms me. Weigh your words before you speak, for my eyes have already become brighter, and my heart beats strongly. Be cautious, or you will make me believe in supernatural agencies. I must obey you, though you bade me call forth the dead or walk upon the water. Hope, my friend, repeated the Count. Ah, said Morel, falling from the height of excitement to the abyss of despair. Ah, you are playing with me, like those good or rather selfish mothers who soothe their children with honeyed words because their screams annoy them. No, my friend, I was wrong to caution you. Do not fear, I will bury my grief so deep in my heart. I will disguise it so that you shall not even care to sympathize with me. Adieu, my friend, adieu. On the contrary, said the Count, after this time, you must live with me. You must not leave me, and in a week we shall have left France behind us. And you still bid me hope? I tell you to hope, because I have a method of curing you. Count, you render me sadder than before, if it be possible. You think the result of this blow has been to produce an ordinary grief and you would cure it by an ordinary remedy, change of scene. And Morel dropped his head with disdainful incredulity. What can I say more? asked Monte Cristo. I have confidence in the remedy I propose. 
and only ask you to permit me to assure you of its efficacy. Count, you prolong my agony. Then, said the Count, your feeble spirit will not even grant me the trial I request. Come, do you know of what the Count of Monte Cristo is capable? Do you know that he holds terrestrial beings under his control, nay, that he can almost work a miracle? Well, wait for the miracle I hope to accomplish, or... Or, repeated Morel, or take care, Morel, lest I call you ungrateful. Have pity on me, Count. I feel so much pity towards you, Maximilian, that, listen to me attentively, if I do not cure you in a month, to the day, to the very hour, mark my words, Morel, I will place loaded pistols before you, and a cup of the deadliest Italian poison, a poison more sure and prompt than that which has killed Valentine. Will you promise me? Yes, for I am a man, and have suffered like yourself, and also contemplated suicide. Indeed, often since misfortune has left me, I have longed for the delights of an eternal sleep. But you are sure you will promise me this, said Morel, intoxicated. I not only promise, but swear it, said Monte Cristo, extending his hand. In a month, then, on your honour, if I am not consoled, you will let me take my life into my own hands, and whatever may happen you will not call me ungrateful. In a month, to the day, the very hour and the date are sacred, Maximilian. I do not know whether you remember that this is the 5th of September. It is ten years today since I saved your father's life, who wished to die. Morel seized the Count's hand and kissed it. The Count allowed him to pay the homage he felt due to him. In a month you will find on the table, at which we shall be then sitting, good pistols and a delicious draught. But, on the other hand, you must promise me not to attempt your life before that time. Oh, I also swear it. Monte Cristo drew the young man towards him, and pressed him for some time to his heart. And now, he said, after today, you will come and live with me. You can occupy Hades' apartment, and my daughter will at least be replaced by my son. Heidi, said Morel, what has become of her? She departed last night. To leave you? To wait for me. Hold yourself ready, then, to join me at the Champs-Élysées, and lead me out of this house without anyone seeing my departure. Maximilian hung his head and obeyed with childlike reverence. End of chapter 105